So yeah, we have uh, Dr. Gondu here talking to us about CRT. Your patient has a CRT device. What's the next steps? What now? Now what? So if you want to take it from here. Okay, sounds good. So my name is uh, Ogunu Engu. I'm an EP physician here in Maryland. And uh, as AJ mentioned, uh, we're just trying to talk about patients with CRT and how to maximize our patient care. I have no disclosures. And um, next slide. Okay. So the objective of today's session is to really look at uh, considerations while programming a CRT device. So whether this is a CRT with a defibrillator or with a pacemaker. And so we're going to go over um, topics like the type of lead that we use, uh, whether based on size or whether based on stability, uh, site of pacing, uh, because that is very critical to maximizing the patient's uh, uh, improvement from an LV uh, function standpoint, and also pitfalls and limitation and also timing that has to do with the CRT timing and trying to maximize AV timing with VV timing. And so this is critical. Um, some of the big centers, we're gonna start with solving a case. Some of the big centers uh, here in the US actually run like CRTD clinics because you know once you implant it, it's always good to make sure that you're maximizing and making sure patient gets the best effect from the CRT. So we'll start with a case study. I uh, have a 72 year old woman with a history of heart failure palpitations. She said a flutter ablation continued to have shortness of breath. And she had a repeat echocardiogram 90 days uh, after being on a guideline mediated, guideline directed medical therapy showed that her LV function was still reduced at 20 to 25%. And this is an EKG that we have on the screen. Um, shows normal sinus rhythm, left bundle branch block, and her QRS is. 180 to 200 milliseconds. So it's a really broad QRS. And it appears like this woman has a non ischemic cardiomyopathy with persistent LV dysfunction in spite of uh, optimal medical therapy. Next slide. So uh, we know that there have been uh, multiple studies uh, that looked at uh, cardiac synchronization therapy. Uh, so we know that for patients that have a, a wide QRS, especially a left bundle branch block, uh, these patients have electromechanical dyssynchrony. It's kind of uncoupled, and this uncoupled electromechanical function translates to discrete dyssynchrony that leads to clinical heart failure symptoms, and it becomes a vicious cycle uh, because the, the more heart failure symptoms you have, the wider the QRS gets. So, you know, it's really something that um, studies, the companion study, the care HF studies have really shown that cardiac synchronization improves uh, this patient's functioning, uh, reduction in hospitalization, 25%, reduction in mortality, and also obviously reduction in cost of care because these patients have recurrent heart failure admissions. So it is proven to be safe and effective, but we also see that it is underutilized. And some uh, uh, centers, they actually do scheduled CRT uh, maintenance. In that sense, the patient comes in after they have their CRTD so they can get an echocardiogram. You can look at their EKG. You can look at their clinical response, whether you do it just by asking them questions or whether they have a six minute walk. But it's important to see that we have to make sure that these patients are truly uh, benefiting from their CRTD so that there's truly a group that may be non-responders but we also believe that there's a group of patients who are not maximized with respect to their CRT. Uh, next, next slide. So uh, brief, uh, this is a busy slide, but it essentially runs us through uh, indications for cardiac synchronization therapy in patients with heart failure. And we can see that, um, you know, essentially these are patients who have uh, QRS uh, widening of greater than 150, EF, low EF, left bundle branch block. And so you can take the algorithm all the way to figure out who needs a CRT. And of course, we also have our patients who, who do not have a left bundle branch block, but they still have an extremely wide QRS complex. And so some patients with um, uh, ventricular conduction defect or ones with right bundle branch block. So you do have also some class of heart failure that you could consider a CRTD. Uh, on this patient, or CRT device. Uh, next slide. And then these are patients who are uh, indications for CRT in patients with pacemakers. 
Again, these are patients where you know that they're gonna have substantial RV pacing uh, of a certain percentage, like patients with complete heart block and already with low EF. So again, you can, these are slides that will be saved uh, so that you know one can always uh, refer to it after the fact. Um, ultimately, usually when you have patients that have just regular sinus node dysfunction without uh, conduction uh, defect, you try to minimize RV pacing but in patients with complete heart block or high grade AV block where you anticipate that they're gonna have a high volume of RV pacing, then a CRT device uh, would also be uh, the best uh, option for them. Uh, next slide. So we're gonna consider considerations for when you when placing a CRT device. We're gonna run through this very briefly. And it's really all about the location of the LV lead. And it is true that sometimes uh, you may have uh, limitations based on the cardiac anatomy, but I think understanding essentially where you want to place this lead is, is critically important. So on the left side, you have the RAO uh, view of a CS venogram. You have the, um, the balloon uh, right there at the beginning of the vessel. And then you do the venogram and you see all the branches, you see the lateral branch, you see the anterior brand, the anterior interventricular vein runs with the left anterior descending artery. So that is a, a lead, this, that's a location that you don't want to place your CRT in. There's absolutely no benefit from placing leads in the anterior vein. And in the LAO, you can see uh, this, the whole side of the LV is where we're trying to, the basal portion of the LV is where we have the latest activation. So we want to maximize lead placement. And sometimes even if you have to, put in leads and the, you have to put the lead to go all the way down. Uh, you still want to see if you can use proximal poles that would maximize uh, the benefit because that is where you have the latest activation of the left ventricle. Next slide. So this is another uh, schematic that shows you again in the RAO view, uh, the, uh, the LV is sectioned off in part. You can see what we call the basal uh, LV the mid LV and the apical part of the LV. Again, the whole idea is that you try to place your lead and uh, pace from the basal lateral LV and not from the apical part. The, the view on the LAO uh, shows you uh, where you would like to maximize lead placement with the, we have the branches of the CS, you have the lateral view, the lateral branches, the anterior lateral branches, the anterior branch, which is uh, completely, uh, not acceptable as a CLT, as a lead location. Uh, but so your best option, your best, the best value is when you place your lead in the basal LV, because that's the site of the hazard list, the latest activation. Next slide. Another view of uh, this coronary sinus branches. You can again see the posterior lateral vein, uh, the great vein, the, lat the branch that, you know, the anterior branch anterior vein and the posterior vein. So whenever we do our CS lead placement, it's always what kind of doing a CS venography so you know what your options are. The, in the early days of LV placement, some physicians where I was, where I was working before would, would just go in and see if they can get a posterior lateral branch. And that's reasonable, but I usually uh, adopt the practice to do a CS venogram just to see what your options are so you know what you're dealing with. And um, next slide. Again, another view uh, emphasizing the branches of the CS and trying to maximize what the best options are to place your lead in the basal lateral LV. Next slide. So the prospect trial assessed the impact of lead placement on CRT uh, response. So placing your LV lead in a lateral or posterior lateral vein actually leads to better outcomes. And so multiple studies have confirmed that this is uh, where you have your delayed, your latest electrical activation. So um, some, in some, some practices, they actually do a little bit of LV mapping with uh, 3D mapping. And if you do that, you will also see that it points you to the basal LV, lateral LV, because that's where you have your latest activation. Next slide. So this is a, a MIDI CRT device that kind of looked at lead placement and outcomes. And as you can see, based on the previous slide that we looked at, looked at uh, patients who had lead placed in the apical uh, anterior 
uh, locations actually did not have as much benefit from the LV lead placement. So the green location is where you're trying to maximize your lead placement. And it is true that sometimes when you put in this lead, you may put the lead in deep into the branch uh, for stability purposes. But now that we have leads where we have option of a multi, multi, multiples, you want to still use, a, 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 if you have a good threshold, you want to leave, use a pole that is more in the basal uh, lateral position. Next slide. So speaking of lead, uh, lead uh, as well, you have to look at size of the lead based on your CS venogram. Your lead cannot be too big, cannot be too small because you have to do what can, what is come you know what can you can get into the vessel and get good stability. So this is an example of uh, lead size. So if you look at this venogram, uh, you have this lead, uh, you have this branch that is appears. Um, a good branch in a lateral position, so to speak. But as you can see, if you if you put the lid all the way in, once one of the branches goes apical, so that will be less optimal. And then you have a branch that goes more lateral. So if it's possible to get the lead into this vessel, and as you can see, the branches, they tend to taper once you get beyond the main branch. But if you can get your lead into the blood vessel and up this lateral area with some stability, that will provide a better pacing option than something that is more apical. This apical lead also, as you can see, is gonna be very close to your RV lead. So essentially you're trying to match lead size, uh, branch size, and also the position of the, uh, the, of the branches. Next slide. So this is another uh, picture that shows us, uh, <clears throat> this is an LAO picture of a CS lead that goes all the way into the CS and it's in the anterior branch, anterior interventricular vein. So this is a lead that you know upfront will not provide any benefit. As you can, you can see the, the CS catheter, you can see the venogram and the balloon inflated. And so this lead is going all the way up and down. So this will not be an optimal uh, location for a CS lead. So if this patient doesn't improve, you will know exactly the, key, the reason is because this lead is not in a good location. You do have options. You do have a lateral branch, a postural lateral branch that will provide a much better option for this lead placement. Next slide. This is another example of a, a CS venogram. Uh, as you can see in this, you don't have a lot of good options in the body of the CS or branches, uh, lateral branches. So in this situation, you may have to go into the middle cardiac vein and then take the lead up as up lateral as you can away from the apex. And you can also see, we also point out uh, this CS is big at the proximal part, there's a little bit of a waste. So these are some of the things that can be a challenge when in LV lead placement. So it's always good to do a CS venogram so you know what, where you are and what your options are. So these are the options. So we have multiple options for lead. Uh, most of the leads that we use now here in the US are all quadripolar leads and they all have different shapes. So based on your venogram, uh, the fixation mechanism may be because it has an S shaped or it has a cant that keeps it, uh, at the that keeps it stable once you, you are into the blood vessel. Uh, next slide. This is an example of some metronic leads. Um, you have <clears throat> the S shaped lead and also you can see that the poles are kind of spaced out so that if you have um, a, if you have a branch that has diaphragmatic pacing, you have poles that are spaced out enough that hopefully you will have poles that are not in the same um, anatomical location as, as the phrenic nerve. So these are examples of metronic leads. Uh, the one, the third one has a fixation mechanism that has some tines. So you can, the times is actually what holds you, holds you in the, in the branch. And then you have the stability quad where after you put the lead in, you, know, so you counter, you, you clockwise the lead and then you tug on it because it has a fixation mechanism right here. As you know, unlike RV leads and RA leads, we, don't, we cannot have real screws on these leads because they're sitting in a vein. So uh, these are examples of uh, metronic leads that you can look at um, with all the sizes. Again, the lead size matters. If you have a huge vessel, sometimes you really have to be able to put it in as distally as possible and then try to use the 
the pores that are more proximal so that you can still say in the basal LV. This is the lid that has the, the stability quad that has the fixation mechanism right there. And so you put this lid in and then you, you, you clock it and then talk back to make sure that the lid actually is fixed in the blood vessel. So we also have a few limitations to CS lid placement, and this would include uh, just a difficult coronary sinus. Sometimes you have a Thebesian uh, vein, which is like a valve that stops you from, that makes it difficult to access the CS. You may have tortuous blood vessels. Uh, you, may have, you may have a nice branch, and then once you're in the branch, you notice that it has diaphragmatic pacing, which of course um, is something that patients cannot live with. Also, you may get into the CS and see that the vessels are very small, and it's not unusual that you have a, a nice, beautiful branch and there's no capture along the whole vessel because you're sitting essentially on a scar. So these are some of the limitations that we deal with. So, um, so this is an example of a bipolar lead and a quadrupolar lead. As you can see, um, the bipolar lead does give you options of pacing unipolar, bipolar, and also uh, extended bipolar to the to other parts of the uh, the pacing uh, system. But when you have a quadrupolar lead, it does give you a multiple option. So it has really made a big difference with respect to uh, uh, CRTB, CRT, having multiple poles. So unipolar lead gives you a little bit of a limited con configuration. You can pace from the distal LV to the CAN, or you can pace from the distal LV to the RV ring. But sometimes we'll, we'll look at this in more details later, because sometimes that can give you anodal capture. So in the CRT the device, if it's a unipolar, it's also very limited. So we rarely use unipolar leads these days. I don't think we have any that we still use. The bipolar lead option gives you multiple options. You can pace from the tip of the LV to the can. You can pace bipolar from the tip to, the, to another pole. You can pace from the LV ring to the RV ring, and you can pace from the tip to the RV ring, although that can give you an uh, anodal capture. So again, having multiple uh, pacing options really has been a game changer to a uh, CRT uh, implant. Again, these are options of bipolar pacing when you have an ICD. Next slide. So this is an example, and, and AJ can also weigh in uh, here. This is an example of, a, of an Abbott device. As you can see, you have four poles, and with these four poles, you can connect them to multiple things that gives you so many options for pacing. I mean, knowing that sometimes when you put these LV leads in, you may be in an area of a scar, you don't really know, so you really have to test all of them and see what gives you the best option. AJ, do you want to comment on this? No, I think that's dead on. Uh, things to remember is that you can't always go every combination, and the combinations that you can do, say, um, you know, for example, you have one to two and one to four as an option. You don't have one to three or... Um, Let's see, uh, distal to, sorry. Anyway, what, what I, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that there are certain combinations that are just not accessible. And a lot of that has to do with avoiding anodal stem because even though you feel like you may be capturing, and we'll explain this later, you may just be capturing at the site of the anode. Um, so you're kind of limited by that. So just being aware whenever you're testing that just because it captures on every vector on the PSA doesn't necessarily mean that it'll capture every vector or be accessible within the device. And that depends company to company um, and also the lead makeup itself. Okay, next slide. Okay, so, so what we are trying to do also is not only to get a good threshold. So we're dealing with multiple things. We're trying to get a good threshold. We're trying to get, uh, because that would help us to maximize longevity because unlike regular ICDs, uh, where you don't do any pacing for our, our, our CRT devices, you, you really want to be pacing every single heartbeat over 95% as much as you can. So you are trying to maximize uh, tr uh, threshold and, and battery longevity. And also uh, we do have options for pacing for multiple sites for patients who are not responding. And the other consideration is diaphragmatic stimulation and anodal stim. So these are all things that we have to deal with at the time of implant. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Yeah, sorry, just to just to specify on this, and we're always happy to talk about this, you know, offline as well. If you ever have questions, but when you're optimizing battery longevity, do take into account uh, impedance. So higher impedance systems tend to have less current drain. Um, if you think about, you know, the uh, the hose. Uh, metaphor that we've used quite a bit to describe current drain. You know, if you have a wide hose, you're going to lose a lot of water. You're going to lose a lot of energy. So keep that in mind if you're using a, a low impedance system by going either to the coil or to the can, you may affect the longevity of the battery over time. However, you could have a very good threshold and that could have a very positive effect on longevity. So it's all about kind of titrating that. Um, same thing when you're talking about how much voltage to put out. Um, sometimes having a wider pulse width is better for battery longevity than um, and staying underneath voltage doublers. So certain companies have different doublers or parts where it takes twice as much energy in order to uh, to output a certain amount. In Abbott St. Jude, for example, anything 2.5 volts and higher will drain more energy or above 2.5 volts. So if you end up having to do an output of three, for example, you may be better off extending the pulse width and then having a lower voltage output to ensure that you still have a good capture um, safety margin, but you're not draining the battery um, as much as it, as it could. That's an excellent point. And also remember that so for many of these patients, even when they're in complete hard lock or dependent, you have an RV lead that also functions. So I really try to program my LV lead uh, just a little bit above the threshold, again, so just to maximize uh, battery longevity. But that's a good point. And I always will do one millisecond if I have a high threshold, again, with what AJ said, just to maximize longevity. So this is a Medtronic uh, device. Um, so for their CRT, they have something called the Vector Express, where they give you like 16 options and it really does run through all the potential uh, pacing uh, threshold because it's different for every company. So like, you know, Medtronic, they can actually do LV2 to LV4. But as AJ mentioned, you really you also have to look at the impedance. So this takes into consideration, not just the threshold, but also the impedance because that makes a big difference with respect to how long the device is gonna last. Next slide. One thing I, I would mention right here too is, um, and as we talked about earlier, uh, Dr. Gondo is, you know, you can always test manually as well. You don't have to use the automated tests that the companies have. And a good way if you're going to do that is to try to use the uh, the vectors that are going to have the lowest capture threshold. So going unipolar uh, or going to coil, that will generally give you your best threshold. If you're not capturing four to coil, um, so the fourth electrode to coil, then that indicates you're probably not going to capture at like four to three or four to one or whatever vector you're planning on using. So assess the best threshold. And then from there, you can see whether or not those electrodes are even viable to pace from. Yes. And, and one way to do this actually during implant, and I usually do this, I just do unipolar on all my vectors. I connect the black to the, to the particular vector that I'm measuring and then connect the red to skin or to the Wheatlanders. And I just measure each one just to get a sense as to how each one lies and then I take it from there. So I always check Unipolar manually before I go into any kind of automated testing. Okay, so um, programming is everything and you know timing of the programming to try to maximize the patient's benefit. So next slide. So, um, so when you put in a CRT device, um, something that we, we've adopted in trying to figure out, because again, if you have a quadrupolar lead, and let's say you have good thresholds on all of them, then something that we always try to measure in the lab is what we call the QLV. This tells us the area of the latest activation. So if you look at this slide, you can you have a QRS complex. This is the atrial electrogram, so we're not using that. But from the QRS complex on the surface lead, you measure that to the positive deflection in the LV or the bigger deflection on the LV electrogram. And what you're trying to do is to adopt the QLV that has the longest interval. So example one has a 90 milliseconds um, QLV. And if you look at the next patient, the QLV is 165 milliseconds. So it tells you that really you are, you are using a pole that is in, a very, in an area of extremely late activation. 
And this is a very important measurement that translates to, again, uh, improved uh, clinical heart failure symptoms, you know, whether it's to reduce the MR, reduce mortality, decrease LA size, decrease hospitalization. It's another surrogate of how good your LV lead placement is. Next slide. So this is another an example of the what was used to do the QLV assessment. So in this patient, uh, using uh, different uh, using different measurements, the patients that have the extra, very uh, in very high QLV again that particular pole is in the LV part that has the latest activation. Usually these are patients that have good reduction, good improvement in their clinical symptoms. The end systolic volume uh, reduction reduced by 50, greater than 15% and quality of life improvement of 10 points at about six months. So it's a good, it's a very simple uh, measurement that you can do in the EP lab at the time of implant. And that allows you to choose your best facing pole, especially if you have options for lead uh, for pole utilization. Next slide. So uh, we did have a question in the chat and thank you very much, uh, Kayla Marrero for, for speaking up. Anyone else who has other questions, please uh, please chime in. Uh, but he said in Africa where most center are resource limited, quad leads tend to be more expensive. Does it mean that we can't get good CRT with bipolar leads? And from your experience, how are the outcomes with bipolar leads? So Dr. Gondo, I think you can probably answer this question a little better, but one thing I would like to point out, um, you know, is from my opinion, I'll let Dr. Gondo really chime in here, it's not that you can't get good CRT, but if we talked about our ideal position, something lateral, something more basal, you're looking at a bipolar here, you only really have a vector that's far enough away from the apex. I mean, you, you, you this is probably your ideal location, I would say, depending on scar, depending on site of latest activation, all the electrical things that we're going to discuss. Um, this is maybe still viable, but when you look at a quartet lead, you have these other options as well. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get good CRT. It doesn't mean that they won't respond. It just means you don't necessarily have all of the options um, for a patient. I mean, the original CRTs were unipolar only. So you only had one electrode and that was still enough, you know, um, success that they continued the technology. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that though. Yes, that, is, that is absolutely correct. You absolutely, bipolar leads are absolutely uh, useful and can be used. And as AJ said, at the beginning of CRT, we will stay like six hours in the lab because you had only a unipolar option and then you get in there and there's diaphragmatic pacing that you have to come back, go to a different vessel, try a different vessel. So it's not that it doesn't work. It absolutely is just as effective. But let's say you have that nice branch that uh, it's good size and then you put in your bipolar lid and you have diaphragmatic pacing on both poles, then you're kind of stuck. So now what you have to do is maybe pull it back. And then when you pull it back, you then you start to worry about stability. So it's just that the, having a quadrupolar gives us more options, but absolutely bipolar lead work just as well. It just, it just may mean a little bit more work. If you get into that vessel and there's a scar or there's a traumatic pacing, then you have to pull back or move it to a completely different branch option. So, but it's absolutely works, okay? So, um, so now the CRT is in, we've chosen the best uh, branch. Uh, we have good thresholds, we have good impedances. So now we talk about what can we do to make sure that we get the best uh, improvement from this device. So the whole idea is to try to take the site of the latest activation. So we've talked about using the QLV, but also we do have uh, company specific algorithms that look at timing of uh, pacing and timing events. Um, so there's optimization that has to do with the AV delay or the AV timing, because sometimes these patients have, they may have a normal QRS and then a left bundle like our patient, or they may have a QR of, they may have a PR interval of 300 milliseconds plus the left bundle. So there are timing optimization that also helps us both with the PR, meaning the AV timing, and also the VV timing, meaning the RV as it relates to the LV. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and take this one. So um, <clears throat> one thing you may see, you know, we talked about, um, you know, physical location of the lead that matters. We talked about electrical location of the lead that matters. Uh, when the lead's already placed, you're pretty much committed to what you have, and it's optimizing based upon that. Um, and you may not have access to EKGs um, in the field, in your clinics. You may be very, very busy, and that's never a good excuse, but sometimes that's just how it is. 
Um, so there are other options within the devices themselves to assess the site of latest activation or the site of greatest electrical dysfunction, um, you know, in, in the heart. So um, Abbott, for example, I'll speak on this one just because I'm, I've been trained on it, but uh, it is your auto VEX select your LV RV conduction timing measurement. What it will do is it will pace in the RV and then it will measure how long it takes for that RV paste event to be sensed in the LV. You can also run a test where it will it will uh, sense in the RV, so how long it takes for the conducted event to be sensed in the RV, and then how long it takes for that same conducted event to be sensed in the LV, and that's the timing differential. will often be much shorter, obviously, because it's going through the conduction pathway instead of from the side of the pace across to the LV. And what that will tell you is where is the greatest electrical dysfunction or the greatest amount of time it takes to get to this pole. That doesn't mean that you happen to be in the site of greatest electrical dysfunction. It just means that electrode of the four is the most uh, different, I guess, the most uh, delayed um, conduction of that electrical activity. So this is just a quick way to assess that and say, okay, well, P4, which, you know, this is the diagram of the heart. It could very well be you know, in the middle cardiac and more apical. So always, you know, reference your notes, reference your uh, your uh, chest x-rays. But P4 is the site of greatest electrical um, delay of activation. So it's probably the most viable site from an electrical standpoint. You also want to take into to account the anatomical standpoint and then threshold, because if you can't capture it P4, it doesn't matter if it's dysfunctional, you're not going to be able to pace it. If you have high thresholds, same thing. You have to decide whether or not it's worth burning the battery at a faster rate to try to address this. A lot of times you try to kind of find a balance where you have a good threshold and you have a decent current drain um, and then assess whether or not the patient responds. And if they don't, that's when you can start adjusting um, your, your choices there. So this is so it's similar. So the, again, timing the optimization, the delay from the RV to the LV, uh, just to make sure that you're maximizing it. So intrinsic LV to RV, you're looking at the electrograms, you already have your RV laid in and you have your LV, LV laid, you can measure the timing in between and then LV pacing to RV sense and vice versa. This is just, a, this just kind of tells us how can we get to this area that's of latest of the latest activation because that's where you get your maximum but it, it, it but it's a trade off too you know if the thresholds over there is extremely high and it's going to drain the battery then maybe you take the one that is not as late so it is really a combination of multiple things and so if you have and you can sometimes pace the RV and the LV together or you can pace, you can have an offset where you pace the LV before the RV or vice versa. So these are things that you measure and you look at the QRS um, complex and you look at the activation because what you're trying to do is to get your QRS to be narrow and also uh, maximize uh, the improvement on the uh, systolic function. If you if you also, if you pace to, if you pace your, if your AV interval is too short, you can then, you can activate your LV too early and that can also, that can be detrimental to the LV filling. So it's an interaction between the AV optimization and the VV optimization to get the best, to get the best uh, timing uh, interval. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so just to go over this kind of example, this is um, Abbott's quick opt. If you're using anything like the sync AV or automated algorithms, I don't even take into account the AV delay optimization, um, but it does make a suggestion for you. Uh, but I generally just ignore this one right here. And this is the real test I'm, I'm concerned with is optimizing the V to V offset. So what it does is it will take an average of eight measured events. It will then uh, from an LV pace to an RV sense timing, from an RV pace to an LV sense timing, and then from the intrinsic conduction. And then from there, uh, it uses an equation, which um, you, know, you could probably ask an, an Abbott engineer or, uh, or some sort of physician to really go deeper into dive here, but it's the LV minus the RV plus intrinsic divided by two, which it auto calculates for you. But if it for some reason doesn't, you can manually get these figures and then just calculate it yourself. And what it does is it makes a suggestion based upon the interventricular delay, how much LV um, early and or simultaneous you would like. Typically, you will not see an indication for right for um, RV first. 
just because you already have some degree of LV dysfunction for a CRT patient. Um, so it's unlikely that you'd want RV earlier pacing or why did you put a CRT in to begin with? But this is just a way for the device to kind of tell you um, how early you should pace. Once again, this is a surrogate. You can also just look at a 12 lead EKG, which is I think in many ways um, superior. And then from there, customize your LV RV offsets. But um, I don't know, Dr. Gundu, if you have any input on that. So, so I think in, in what I do in a practical sense uh, during implant, uh, because uh, we don't normally have a, a real 12 lead during implant because we don't have all the precordial leads. Uh, but we do try to use some surrogates to look at the QRS complex. And it is, it's, it's a little bit crude, but I think most times we'll look at, as AJ said, we'll look at the QRS complex and see uh, what it looks like. And then we'll also look at what the device is suggesting that we do, you know, the automatic optimization. And many times they do align together where you are either doing a little bit of your LV first or sometimes it's simultaneous. So I, I use both. I, I do use just looking at the QRSs that I have on the screen from the left bundle to see which one looks the best, uh, kind of a crude way to do it. And then I also use, uh, I kind of use the device and, and then we'll come up to a good uh, setting. So, um, so the atrial to ventricular timing AV delay, I think this becomes important in patients who have uh, like, you know, really long PR interval or really short uh, PR interval because I, I do remember there were in the past, there was some algorithm that suggested that you really should pace at a very short AV delay so that you don't have any pre-excitation uh, of the LV or the RV. But if you make your AV delay too short, then you really don't complete your atrial kick. And so that can be detrimental. And I would say that ultimately when our patients are in the clinic, we, we would use that, what the device suggests to us. We use the automatic optimization and then program it as the device suggests. So yeah, I'll just go through this really quick. Uh, so this is the Sync AV algorithm. Uh, Medtronic has one I believe called Adapt-A, which runs fairly similarly. But essentially what these are doing is it's measuring your, your timing between the uh, A sense and the V sense. And then from there, um, the Abbott takes a measurement of three, and this is to avoid PVCs and anything kind of complicating it. Um, from there, you'll subtract either a delta of timing, say 50 milliseconds, or a delta of a percentage of this interval. And then that's where your bi-V pace happens. And let me see if I can find a heart diagram here, just one second. The idea behind it is that you're actually trying to synchronize, say we're pacing from this electrode, you're trying to synchronize the LV pace, the RV pace, and the intrinsic conduction that's coming down through the uh, from the from the AV node down to the to the ventricles. And the idea is that you're engaging as much tissue as possible. And part of what you're doing here is you're obviously going to look at your 12 lead and say, how is this affecting your, um, you know, your QRS duration? The idea is that a shortened QRS duration um, is associated with better outcomes. And if you want to read more on that, I would say uh, Truco et al. And there's talks about fusion optimized intervals. But once again, the idea is to try to fuse the LV pace, the RV pace, and the intrinsic conduction together to try to minimize the total electrical timing it takes to engage the uh, ventricular tissue. And we'll get here. Okay, so an example of what we're, we're talking about. So if you look at this uh, series of uh, EKGs, so you have a patient with a baseline left bundle, uh, the PR interval is about 190 milliseconds. Um, the QRS is wide. And so you look at, if you program the device where you have an AV delay, so this patient starts off with an AV delay of 190 milliseconds. On the second panel, the AV delay is now 100 milliseconds, and you are pacing the LV and RV simultaneously. So the offset is zero. So that means the program the same. So you look at the pattern of the EKG, and you can see that lead one definitely uh, looks different on the limb leads because you can see now that it's more right axis. So lead one and AVL are now negative compared to lead one and AVL at baseline. So you can tell that you do have LV input uh, clearly. The QRS is also narrower. It still looks like left bundleish, but you can see that V6 is negative. So V5 and V6 tells you that you definitely have LV input coming in. On the third panel, 
you have the AV delay has been increased to 200 milliseconds. So it's now comparable to what you have at baseline, which was 190 milliseconds. And again, you can see in lead, lead one and ABL, you do see definite LV input, also V5, V6, but the QRS still looks a little bit different, okay? So then you go to uh, the last panel, AV delay is now 200 milliseconds, which is comparable to the 190 milliseconds. But now you are pulling in your LV lead in first. So the LV RV offset is 80 milliseconds. So the LV is coming in. And if you look at lead one, and uh, let me see, lead one and ABL, you can see that lead one is very negative. You can see it's a little bit wider. Uh, the QRS complex, so now V1 has like uh, a right bundle like. So that tells you that you're pulling in more LV input in this particular last panel. So you have a, almost like a, a right bundle, at least you have an R wave, which you didn't have before and in V1, and also you have uh, V5, V6, all negative. So the LV input on the last panel is greatest and the QRS is, is the most, is narrowest compared to panel two and panel three. So this shows you how, even though the AV delay is kept the same in between panel three and panel four, having an LV offset where the LV is pulled in earlier gives you a much narrower QRS. So if, if you didn't have all the automatic things and you just had your 12 lead, I would program my patient with the LV offset to make the QRS as narrow as possible, as opposed to uh, panel two and panel three. So again, this is just doing it with a 12 lead EKG. And one thing to note here, um, obviously it's it's patient to patient. So this is the best programming for this specific patient. I would not just take this and do this for every single patient you see because it could be have a very much opposite effect. So it's really, you know, catering the device programming to the patient that you're seeing. So um, just going to briefly touch on this. Um, so some at, so Abbott devices, most Abbott devices, a CRT do have a multi-point pacing option. I'm sure other manufacturers down the road either do or have one coming out, but it just allows you to pace from more than one site. Um, things to keep in mind, though, um, you know, obviously you want to start with your site of latest activation as your first initial pace, um, ideally, and then your second pace will be something greater than 30 millimeter electrode spacing. So this kind of goes back to our previous conversation on what lead you choose matters. If you choose, for example, the 1456 um, quartet lead, it is a shorter electrode spacing with 40 millimeters from the tip to the um, proximal electrode, which means the only viable electrodes you could choose were one and four. Um, if you, for example, use the 1458QL, once again, I'm just throwing numbers at you, but if you look it up, um, it's going to be a wider spacing with 60 millimeters from tip to prox, which means there's more options for having that greater than 30 millimeter electrode spacing. Uh, battery life considerations do have to be taken into account, especially if you're using a reprocessed device or if it's a patient where, you know, this is a economically impactful, um, you know, device that they bought and they're worried about buying another one down the road. Uh, Multipoint does have a effect on the battery longevity of a CRT, and um, it would maybe be considered in patients where you're trying to conserve battery as a um as a non-responder option. So it may not be your first option for patients where you don't know if they're going to get another device or it could be um, you're worried about the total battery longevity. Um, but if if money and time is not an issue, then you can obviously consider that as a, as a first option as well. Okay, but my comment on this also is that if you have a patient with a really big LV, you know, like sometimes have patients with like eight to nine centimeter LV, this is a really good option, especially if you use one that has uh, gives you um, uh, a, a lot of distance between the electrode because perhaps you can capture more and be able to lead to an improvement in CRT efficacy. So it's definitely a consideration. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, we don't have EP stuff, but there could be times where you have like a block or electrical dysfunction between electrodes as well. And those can be associated with good response because you're engaging two patches of tissue that are, you know, maybe electrically more isolated from one another. And so now uh, we, so the Medtronic has a program called, called Adaptive CRT, 
So um, they've had some studies that do show that you can actually LV only pacing is preferred over by V pacing when you have a normal conduction interval from, from the atrium to the ventricle. So if you have a PR interval that's 100 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds, the proposal is that LV only pacing uh, can actually be, uh, can lead to good uh, CRT response. So they've been able to show that you have better, better hemodynamics with LV preactivation if your heart rate is lower. So in patients with heart rate in the 80s, sometimes our heart failure patients run a, a persistent sinus tachycardia, so that may not work as much. And also if your LV only pacing, it also saves device energy. Because remember, uh, a typical by V, we're pacing the LV and the RV for every single heartbeat. And that's why our by Vs don't last 12 years like our single chamber non-pacing devices. However, by V is pacing, uh, by V pacing, meaning pacing both the LV and the RV is preferred if you have a long PR interval, um, if the AV delays are adjusted to pace after the end of the P wave. So there are things that you can do uh, to promote that. Uh, there's also a higher percentage of by V pacing if the AV delay is adjusted to pace in advance of the intrinsic QRS. So you want to come in ahead of the QRS. If you have somebody with a PR interval of 300 milliseconds, you're going to have to program your by V pacing so that you come in before that very, very, very late QRS complex comes in. Um, so this is the Metronic Adaptive CRT, uh, the research that they did. So many of my patients who have a short PR interval, I do LV only pace them. Um, um, and if they're doing well, I'll, I'll leave them program themselves. And this can also be dynamic. They do check it because the PR interval can change in patients. You know, they're beta blockers, then you put them on amiodarone and all sorts of medications. So that is also something that is not fixed. So you really have to make it a, a dynamic uh, situation. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I think, and that's that's a good point. I, I didn't mention when I was talking about uh, sync AV is the same as these dynamic algorithms take into account, you know, not only changes in electrolytes or, you know, medications and things like that, but also um, it could just be positional. It could be time of day. Um, people don't have the same conduction all the time and the ability to continually remeasure it helps. Uh, activity, for example. So patients who are getting up and moving, you may see shorter uh, conduction. And if you don't have a dynamic algorithm and you have a longer AV delay, you may be losing the by V advantage when their uh, conduction is shorter. And so this was a, a presentation from um, um, Europe Heart Reading uh, last year in 2023. And it did show that really adaptive AV delay, adaptive uh, CRT pacing, meaning LV only for patients with normal uh, AV interval, that the patients did well, uh, they did not have any uh, reduction in their CRT benefit. So that was actually uh, pretty significant. Uh, next slide. And this is also uh, part of that uh, adapt response study showing that uh, adaptive uh, uh, programming with Medtronic devices is actually can also lead to uh, excellent uh, improvement in CRT uh, benefits. Again, as I mentioned, it is something that's dynamic because uh, this, it can change every minute. So a patient has optimized kind of in a, in a very dynamic way based on medications, electrolyte, vagal tone, and, and things like that. So it, it's something that's not a fixed programming. It is a dynamic uh, programming. Next slide. So pitfalls to uh, CRT. Um, so chronic nerve stimulation is, is a real big problem in, in uh, doing these implants. And so when we do uh, pacing, the first thing we do actually when I put my LV lead in, the first thing I do is to check for diaphragm because if diaphragm, if diaphragmatic capture is less than LV capture uh, threshold, then it's a non-viable option. And it, it can be positional. And sometimes you identify it in the lab. It's not unusual too that after you've sent a patient home, you know, these leads are sitting in blood vessels so they're not really fixed. So sometimes patients can show up to clinics saying that they're having hiccups all the time, which is essentially diaphragmatic pacing. So uh, something that you can do is to lower the voltage and use a higher pulse to see if you can eliminate uh, diaphragmatic uh, capture. And also uh, you have to, we also are aware, if I have a patient that had diaphragmatic capture at five volts and the threshold on my LV lead is 1.2, I would accept that position or program my patient at maybe around two, and I wouldn't have the auto capture algorithms because sometimes when those happen in the patient, and if it happens maybe at night, they will then start to experience some of the diaphragmatic uh, stimulation, which patients find very uncomfortable. And don't forget 
that sometimes you can also, um, yeah, EJ mentioned, yeah, if you're doing your cases under general anesthesia, which I don't usually do my cases, patients under GA, but if you have your patients who are under GA, please make sure that you ask the anesthesiologist to make sure they're not paralyzed because if they have a paralytic, then you're not going to be able to demonstrate it. And that can be very painful when they go to the holding area and then their whole chest is jumping and then you have to go back into the lab. And don't forget that you can also have diaphragmatic capture from right atrium and RV leads. That can happen. And sometimes we forget, we always blame it on the LV lead. So always confirm which lead is causing it before you move your beautiful LV lead position. Um, next slide. Yeah, one thing I would say when you're actually testing, so you may have it where the lead is pulled and moved around or for whatever reason, when you go to test in clinic, you may not just observe it at baseline sitting down, but having them lay on their left side or lean on their left side, having them roll um, if need be, or, you know, placing your hands on their abdomen and feeling whether or not you actually feel that rhythmic hiccuping. Generally, you can actually feel it yourself as well uh, is a good way to test. That way you don't send the patient home thinking that it's all in their head. And then they continue to have it at night when they go to sleep and lay on their left side. That's a good point. So uh, we do have a, a like, it looks like uh, Ijoma has joined us here. Um, if you're under general, okay, she mentioned that. Okay, I see that. Yeah. Never mind. Um, okay, so anodal stem is one thing that I wanted to chat about. Um, you know, basically what can happen is when you're pacing, you can have a high, um, uh, just a buildup of polarization on uh, the anodal electrode. And what can happen is you can actually start causing uh, capture at the anode. So um, you tend to see this more when you have, say, for example, a larger cathode and a smaller anode. You kind of have this siphoning of this, this uh funneling effect and you end up with a, a buildup of polarization. And as a result, uh, you may think you're capturing at the cathode. You may very well be capturing at the cathode, but you could be capturing at the anode as well. Things to take into account is output. So if you have a higher output, uh, you're more likely to see this. Um, so sometimes you can even uh, avoid this with, uh, with pulse width. And then obviously simply avoid pacing from a, from a smaller, uh, to a smaller anode will often um, prevent this from happening. And then in CRT pacing, we'll go over this later as well, but always avoid pacing to an RV ring if you can absolutely help it. So I wanted to show you this example. Uh, this is from 2004, and this is a unipolar system, I would say, judging from that time frame, could be a bipolar. But here we see an LV threshold test, and they're LV pacing only in this test. This is not an RV pacing. You're looking at lead one, and I, I'll let the physicians chime in you know, on this right here, but um, you can see capture and LV capture in lead one as you pace at 1.5 volts. As they decrease it down at 1.25, you see a drastic change here in the, um, in the morphology on the EKG. You continue down, you still have capture here. And then finally, you see a clear loss of capture where there's no evoked response. So what's actually happening here is the LV lead is capturing, and I assume the anode is probably capturing as well at the same time. Um, so the LV and the RV are essentially both being captured at once. You lose capture in the LV, but the anodal capture threshold is much lower. So you continue to capture, and then finally you don't capture. All right, what's the implication to this? If you think that you're capturing in the LV because you didn't hook them up to an EKG. If you look here, if you're just looking at your EGMs, this looks like capture either way. So you could set, you could say, oh, my threshold is 0.75. I'm going to set my voltage at 1.25. And you'll be pacing this patient twice in the RV with absolutely no LV pacing at all. And they will not respond. Um, you could even pace them into heart failure um, as a result of it. So Always making sure that you actually have true LV capture is is really key to this. And just a second, I'm going to promote some people here because I don't I saw more people joined in I didn't promote earlier. Do you have any input on that though? Uh, yeah, no, that's a good, very good point to know because if you looked at the e-grams, you will think, oh yeah, this is great. You know, I have I have I have capture all the way down here, but meanwhile you lost real capture of the LV, and what you have going on there is local RV uh, capture. So it's really important to note this, that uh, this is something that can happen and you'll just be pacing the RV and patient will have absolutely no improvement or as AJ said, or perhaps could even be worse. Yeah. 
Thank you. So going over that again, so avoid pacing LV to RVR, our RV ring, um, instead of using uh, unipolar to LV. So this is in a pacemaker example. Obviously, in an ICD, you don't have the ring options, uh, but they list as these as all you know viable options as going to that ring. But the ring electrode typically is smaller than the um, than the LV electrodes, and you are more likely to get anodal stem, even if it's the same size. You can have anodal stem. So. If you do have our anodal stimulation at that site, um, even if you're capturing the LV, you're not getting the full advantage of your um, offset that you've programmed in. If you have LV first by 80, it doesn't really matter because you're still going to be capturing in the RV simultaneously. Um, so that eliminates that benefit. And then on the absolute worst side, you could end up um, thinking you're capturing the LV and not capturing at all. So I wanna give you one Case study, this was a uh, Abbott 3262 CRTP. Uh, it was actually St. Jude at that time. Uh, patient had a pocket revision. So I actually saw this patient. Um, they had been twiddling it a little bit. Um, and when I went in, I noticed that there was programmed LV tipped RV ring. Um, what had happened is the clinic had made some changes to the programming because they realized, oh my gosh, I have such a low threshold tip to ring vector. So I'm going to use this because it's going to be so much better for the battery. I go in and I realize that we actually have anodal capture down to 0.5 volts. Um, so we'll go over it really quick here. So here we have RV only pacing. So I went ahead, I hooked up a surface electrode, um, not always my practice, but it should be for everyone, um, hooked up a surface electrode and observed here what the morphology looks like, RV only pacing. Um, the other indicators here, you know, were lead three, um, I got to change this around. But anyway, so you're looking at, for example, the uh, the EGMs. <clears throat> we see that the RV bipolar EGM activation before the LV bipolar EGM activation. So that indicates that RV is going first. Next, we do how it was programmed, LV only pacing, the third electrode to the RV ring. As you can see, the EKG looks stunningly similar to RV only pacing on the surface. So if that wasn't your dead giveaway here, you take a look at your EGMs, you have a um, RV pace and the deflection is just in line with the LV pace. This indicates that you're probably anodal capture of the RV as well as possible, most likely capture of the LV uh, as well, but it's just simultaneous or near simultaneous capture. Finally, you look at LV only M3 to CAN. So in this way, you see the morphology has changed considerably on the surface. This is their strongest indicator. But if you take a look at your EKGs, you can see here LV activation early, followed by RV activation, which indicates that there is a delay here. So also the patient is in flutter or possibly fib, who can tell, but. And then the final programming, LV, uh, sorry, M3 to CAN, LV first by 80 milliseconds. So you can see this here. If you're really concerned about a dependent patient, uh, for example, you can do this programming with a wide LV RV offset instead of doing LV only, and it can give you the same results. Anybody have any input on that? No, but yes, I think uh, what you demonstrated here, yeah, having the e-grams and clearly trying to follow uh, what comes first when you pace is actually critical because you can tell here that when you pace, the LV comes in and then the RV comes in. So at least, and also looking at the surface EKG, sometimes when you're pacing the LV and it looks like a lack bundle, something is not right. You should think about, you know, what is different. You know, if I think I'm capturing the LV, the morphology should not look like a typical lack bundle because that doesn't make any sense. So that could be anodal capture as well. So those are some of the things. So, so just, yeah, just to review, avoid pacing from a larger cathode to smaller anode, um, ex avoid excessive outputs, always have a surface EKG available. And then, um, you know, you can look at um, activation timing. So um, there are some studies here. These are clickable, but feel free to actually just Google these studies as well to talk over that. So, so okay. So in conclusion, really, we do know that 30% of patients with advanced heart failure have a wide QRS. And QRS being long, QRS widening is a marker of desynchrony. And so we know that patient CLTD is a proven uh, treatment uh, for patients uh, with advanced cardiomyopathy. 
So it's being able to maximize this patient with their left bundle. They have the most of the benefits if the QRS is over 1, 150 milliseconds. But being able to maximize this, putting the lead in the right place, choosing the right anatomy, choosing the right lead, uh, the right branch of the coronary sinus, and the size of the lead, these are all things that you have to check. Making sure that you don't have diaphragmatic stimulation at the time of implant, making sure that you don't have an adult stimulation, because that may fool you to think that you're doing by pacing when you're not doing that. And also optimizing your AV delay, your VV delay. And we talked already about adaptive um, CRT, that that has been proven to be an acceptable way to manage by V. And also the other things I would have mentioned that doesn't have to do with the device itself, uh, dealing with things like AF with RVR, making sure that you have high percentage of pacing, dealing with things like PVC, for every 1% increase in your by V pacing, you decrease, you have a 6% reduction in heart failure and death. And for every 1% uh, increase in effective by V pacing, you also decrease the patient 10% uh, reduction in death on adverse events. So it's really important to, beyond the implant, continue to look at this patient and making sure that you are maximizing the benefit uh, from the CRT device, whether it's with pacing or with the defibrillator. Um, let's see. Is that the last slide, AJ? Sorry, I was stuck there. Um, it is pretty much one question for you. The last other slide is the actual, um, looks like the EKG that's corrected from our initial case study. Um, what do you think about trigger pacing? Because you had talked about pacing percentage. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of different answers in this. Do you think trigger pacing is viable or do you think it's just kind of makes us feel better because we see a higher pacing percentage? Oh, that's a good question because I think uh, recently I used to do that, look at that a lot with my Medtronic devices. And then recently I got a report from my, my device tech that kind of gave me by V pacing and then trigger pacing. I think it was with an Abbott device. I, was, I didn't even know that that was something that also had that algorithm. You know, I do think that if you have patients who have um, irregular rhythms like AFib, um, even, though if, even if they don't have RVR, you have to take into consideration trigger pacing. So I do use that as part of uh, my overall uh, by V pacing uh, percentage. Um, I do use trigger pacing as well. I don't know if um, who are the other implanters online. I don't know if EJ has any um, comment on that, but yes, I do, I do use trigger pacing as part of, because sometimes your, your rhythm is so irregular that you really cannot, you really cannot completely uh, have them fully by V paste uh, without including trigger pacing, where you trigger, where you see the QRS and then you you do the pacing uh, once once you sense the QRS complex. And I think this may be the EKG. I don't know if this is the EKG for the patient, our first patient that we looked at with the wide QRS. Um, I think this may be the EKG post by V. Yeah, this this was our patient at the beginning, and now they have a CRT device. And I think the important part is to continue to evaluate, evaluate this patient even after the implant. And whether you're doing um, EKGs, apart from clinical improvement, uh, LV volumes, reduction in MR, reduction in left atrial size, uh, looking at the EKG, because sometimes people lose by V pace and I've had patients come into the office three years after doing so well, and you look at the EKG and they've lost by V pacing for whatever reason, whether it's the lead pullback, which is a little bit unusual, after the lid has been in for a while, but sometimes that can happen. And uh, just really looking at them holistically. I don't do as much echo optimization as we used to do. It's very time consuming. And for us implanters, we need a non-invasive um, cardiologist working with us. So I don't do a lot of echo optimization in my office, but that is also something that is done in some of the bigger centers where they look at your AV, uh, your indices, just to make sure that you're programmed uh, appropriately. I think many of the automatic programmings from the devices uh, have really taken over uh, that whole echo optimization. I think there's a question from Julius. Oh, hi, Dr. Ingo, sorry. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll... <laughs> I was just making a, a, a point and then I think my, my colleague Jared chimed in as well. So what I was saying when you're speaking about the PNS, when you're trying all the different uh, vectors. So I've tried maybe all the different vectors and, and the patient was still getting diaphragmatic twitches. And then what I did was I lowered the pulse wave slightly 
and put their voltage up only slightly, which which achieved threshold, um, but the PNS disappeared. Okay. But you get that in very small cases. It doesn't happen very often because obviously the higher the threshold, you're more likely to get PNS. Okay. So it's so always that's... worth trying that, yeah. Okay, we're trying to just reduce the pulse wave. Or, or, or at least, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Just right, to get, yeah. get past the diaphragmatic pacing, okay, from yeah. the simulation. Okay, that's a good point. And some, um, sometimes when you see this in the office, it's really a difficult thing to deal with because the patient is already home. And as, as AJ said, you have to you know, take a deep breath, roll over, do all sorts of things. Yeah, to that's to true. Replicate it. So, yeah, you just have to find a way to get around it without having to go back in to revise the whole system. Yeah, Jared has got a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, just sorry, Jared. Um, one, one thing on that statement there, I, I've actually seen the inverse effect where extending the pulse width and lowering the voltage is more beneficial. So I think, you know, just try whatever options you have um, because it doesn't mean you have to necessarily abandon that vector or not use the LV lead. It just means that there's maybe some programming you can do. Sorry, Jared, you, you had something? Sorry, right, AJ. Sorry, AJ, I've actually made a mistake here. I meant exactly the opposite. I'm sorry about that. I made it, I meant exactly the opposite. So extending the pulse width and lowering the voltage. Sorry, oh, okay. I've made a mistake. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, yeah, so we're in agreement. Yeah, so voltage yeah. is usually associated with, with uh, PNS um, or diaphragmatic stimulation. So you can extend the pulse width out and lower your voltage output while still getting capture and you will avoid the instance. I hadn't seen the opposite, Julius, but I didn't want to call you out because maybe you've yeah, seen sorry, it. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I said, I said, sorry, sorry about that. No, sorry, you go. I meant the opposite, yeah. Oh, sure. But but again, I think it's really a matter of what works, you know? It's, you know, these are things that are not etched in stone. Once you have phrenic nerve stimulation and if it's running right along all your poles, it can be very frustrating because you may have a very nice location and then if you go to a different place, it's all scar. So oftentimes you're just trying to see what works uh, because phrenic nerve stimulation is you know, completely, you know, people cannot tolerate that. It's very unpleasant and uncomfortable. Dr. Daphne, have you come across any of these uh, issues? I see Dr. I see Jared has his hands up. Yeah, Jared, do you have something? Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Mr. Gudu, thank you very much for the great presentations. I have some few uh, questions. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, yes, Dr. Dr. We can, yes. Oh, very good. Um, have you come across a situation where a patient has um, um, LV leads and maybe during the process of change, uh, change of that leads, uh, there was a high voltage and it drained that lead down and you couldn't take out that heavy lead. You have to implant another heavy lead in that situation. What do you do? That is one. Then second question is on the issue of um, uh, a patient who had, uh, as at the time the patient was on the bi -V -pacing. he was on a, uh, she was on a sinus reading but on the process of following that patient up, the patient developed uh, atrial fibrillation. Apart from medication, which other options do you have uh, currently as an EP? Then the third, uh, uh, the third question is on the issue of uh, which patient do you defer for uh, left bundle area pacing uh, uh, apart from putting them uh, on the by v pacing. Okay, Th thanks, Dr. Daffe. So, so okay, three questions. So, the question about the old CS lead, actually, uh, I've come across that a few times, and I have to tell you, the CS leads they tend to come out easier than our regular ICD leads with dual coil or single coil or old pacer leads. Um, mm -hmm. So usually I try to take them out, and I have to say they come out even after they've been there for a few years. Uh, but obviously, I think I've also seen a patient who had a CS lead that was placed, uh, an old CS lead, and they had another CS lead placed in a different vessel. I mean, the CS is obviously as, as sizable in some patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. It's, it's a big vessel. Uh, but I often tr I try to pull out the old lead, and, and usually it comes out without needing a lead extraction. 
and um, I'll let other people comment subsequently. But for patients with AF, it's a couple of options. If the left atrium is um, not too big and you think sinus rhythm is still possible, I think it's reasonable to try to get them into sinus rhythm, even if you have to maintain them on an antiarrhythmic drug like um, uh, like amiodarone. Um, obviously, if the left atrium is too big or they have like severe valvular disease and you don't think sinus rhythm is going to happen, then one option is, and for the first patient, you could also consider an ablation um, if, okay. you, if, if it's possible, if you have it, if you have it available. Uh, but other option is to do an AV node ablation where you completely disconnect uh, the atrium from the ventricle and then there'll be by V pacing if they have rapid okay. ventricular response. If their ventricular mm -hmm. response is okay, if they're slow on beta blockers, then you don't have to worry about it because as far as you can achieve over 95% by V pacing, that will still be accepted mm -hmm. and they will still have benefit. Yeah. So either you put them in sinus rhythm if possible, possible with either medication, cardioversion or ablation, rate control or ultimately ablate the AV node. Then your third question is about a conduction, other conduction um, system pacing. Like, Let's see. Uh, yes, left mundo area pacing. Which patient do you defer for that? Apart from putting them on uh, by V pacing, you prefer to use left mundo area pacing for them? Uh, well, I've had a few patients where I start off with an intention to do a CS lead and I go in, do a CS venogram, and there are no optimal options. So for those patients, I would already have a plan that doing a left bundle pacing will be my bailout option. So I do have patients that I start off with a, with a, with a, a view to put an LV lead in. I do have a hospital here, which has a huge heart failure population, INOVA, and they're mm. almost exclusively doing left bundle pacing for their patients. Yes. So that is kind of an interesting. I mean, I haven't I haven't moved to that kind of um practice, but it is good to know that it, it is a, a bailout option if you if you cannot get a CS lead in or if you have a CS lead and there's a lot of diaphragmatic pacing or there's a lot of scar and the thresholds are four volts at one and kind of unacceptable uh, parameters like that, then a left bundle pacing will be um, a good option. And I just want to yeah. mention too yeah. that um you know, um, this is um, Ijama Akero here. I just want to mention that, you know, there has been, you know, uh, guidelines that have been published and we can make that available in the chat after um, the presentation from 2023 yeah. about conduction system pacing. Well, um, basically they called it, and it included both left bundle pacing and, um, you know, CS pacing. And there are a few mm. factors that they make clear that number one, you know, the preponderance of evidence is still for CRT in patients that it's indicated for. So patients with heart failure, patients with high degree of pacing, that's where we have all the evidence and that's still a level one recommendation. However, you know, it is a reasonable bailout, like Dr. Ungo said, it's a reasonable bailout for those patients. So for that other hospital that is doing it as per, that is their goal, either they're trying to do it as part of a registry and they're trying to see what happens, um, but it is not yet, you know, standard of practice. So standard of practice is still CRT. And then if you don't have any viable options, then you can do, you know, conduction system pacing. And then, you know, they've actually even made a, a caveat that if you are putting in a dual chamber pacer, you know, you don't even know what's the, um, you know, what the patient is going to do. It's a reasonable option for you to go straight for conduction system pacing, conduction even system though... Pacing even though people are still concerned about what this means for the future. We're not going to know because remember for CRT, we have evidence that's 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, right? So we kind of know CRT. For conduction system pacing, you know, we have evidence for like four or five years, right? So we're not going to know until the future. We might come out in another five years and they'll say, hey, looking at those patients that we did love bundle pacing, these are the outcomes and they're not that great. So that's the reason why we, everything is just, it's it's very, very small increments. You know, it's definitely good that we have love bundle pacing for those patients who, you know, don't have an option as a bailout. Um, but it is, you know, it's it's one of those things that you definitely have to consider. And I do have okay, a couple great. of patients that I couldn't get an LV lead in at the time of uh, when I tried to do their by V. So what I did was I capped yeah. it 
with a view to come back in a few months because sometimes you have the valve it's just impossible to get past that valve and after 50 minutes of fluoro you have to stop so this young patient i'm going to bring this patient back i'm going to try again to put a cs lead because sometimes you come back and the valve is open you're like i don't know what happened the last time but at least i know that i'm already planning if i can't get the cs lead in i'm going to put in a pacing lead and then change his device to a device that can have the um, ICD lead, the atrial lead, and then I'll put a pacing lead into the left bundle just so that he can have some CRT. But again, it's a, it's a bailout uh, option for me at this point. Option. Perfect. Okay, that is great. So my, no, from this explanation you gave, if a patient uh, can't get a left, uh, a left, um, left ventricular lead in, and there is an option for a left bundle uh, area pacing. So you will put an ICD lead separate and the left bundle pacing separate. Is that what you just said, man? Yes, for this particular, because it's an ICD. So when I did yeah. him, I couldn't get, in, couldn't get an LV lead in. So I actually put in a device and I capped mm. the LV port just to not be wasteful with a view to come back in a few months maybe the, the valve will be more cooperative that day. But in this situation, mm -hmm. I already told Medtronic, if I try again to get the LV lead, if I can't get it in, then I'm gonna change it and leave his ICD lead in and then put in a pacing lead into the left bundle and hopefully synchronize him because he has a wide left bundle and he's, he's young with a terrible okay. lumbar function, yes. So you know that was the patient will have two, uh, two batteries, one on the left, one on the right? The patient will have what? <laughs> two batteries. Why? <laughs> No, I didn't understand. The patient will have two batteries. Oh, no, 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 this no patient, same battery. The same battery. So I'm going to, so what I'm saying is that when I did his initial implant, I couldn't get into the LV. So instead of yeah. using a dual chamber, because I knew I had to come back because he's very young. So what I did was okay. I, I plugged it. I plugged the LV port, hoping to come back All in right. a few months and see if I can get in. So now if I go back in and I can't get the CS still because this valve just won't get out of the way, even from below, mm. then what I will mm. do at that point is to put a pacing lead into the left bundle and then change okay. the generator out and put in one where I can put in two pacing leads and still leave his, uh, his ICD lead. So same device, same oh, device. fine. Different device. I got your point. Yeah, because you have to remember Thank though you. that your your the can is important, right? So if you're going to put in a lead in the um like a pacing lead of a left bundle or left branch bundle area pacing right for your crt mm. is going to be a bipolar can for the pacing for the lv lead port right it's not going mm. to be you can't use a quad pull can right so you have to be very aware of what you're doing before you open up mm. the generator before you're opening up you know anything so if you're doing you know the level where you're going to take a stepwise approach you know first of all you have to determine before you open up the generator you have to determine what brand you're going for what kind of lead will go there and then you open up your generator and the generator has to be able to fit what you're eventually going to do so sure. for a quadrupolar generator you can't use that and put in and say oh okay i'm going to maybe upgrade this in a few months to possibly have a left bundle area can you can't do that because it's going to be a pacing lead and it has to be bipolar so those are the things correct. you just have to think about that's all correct mm. thank you ma thank you dr mr Gudu. thank you dr uh Ijo, ma. Mm. all right i think jared had a question can you hear me Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't want to harp on this PNS too much, but I wanted to backtrack if I can. Um, just for those newbies to CRT and you know whether it's implanting or, or follow up, it's um, when you do see phrenic capture ac acutely, you know whether it's an hour or a day after. <clears throat> excuse me, the procedure. Then sometimes there's no need to panic if you have a good safety margin between what the phrenic threshold margin is and the actual capture threshold. So that's really important that, and what I mean by that is you test, you, if you get phrenic capture, then you bring down the voltage until you lose phrenic capture. And then you keep bringing that voltage down until you lose actual LV capture. And if you've got a really good safety margin, then you don't really have to do anything. You don't need to rush the patient back to, to the lab or you don't really need to program too much. now. If I was to give you, you know, for example, if the fresh, if you're getting phrenic capture at five volts and you had lost at four volts, 
and you're still LV capturing and you did your threshold all the way down and it lost at one volt, then you can program the LV lead to two volts and knowing that you don't have for any capture at least up until four volts. So you've got a decent safety margin there. So it's just another little technique just to be aware of that if you do see for any capture, then, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. That's, that's an excellent point. And I've often actually accepted for any threshold of about three with an LV threshold of one, if that's my only option. And I, because ultimately when the patient leaves the lab, everything changes when they sit up. So it's not unusual that you had that phrenic capture that was the only branch and it's at three and LV threshold is below one. I would still take that vessel. So you're absolutely correct. It, it's not all doom and gloom. Sometimes you just have to take what you get. And oftentimes the patient would actually be okay if your LV threshold stays low. Um, so that's a good point. So <clears throat> Dr. Ingu, just really, really quickly so I can um, redeem myself. <laughs> yeah. to, yeah. So um, in a very, very odd, like I said, not very, very small cases, um, there was a, um, a congenital patient um, and basically a diaphragmatic twitch and all the time in all the different vectors that you could think of. And there was a little bit of it, like Gerald said, there was a little bit of a safety margin, not too much. So um, the LV pace and output was set at 2.5 and then the threshold would be about 2.2. It is possible to put um, basically um, the LV pace and output at maybe 2.3 or 2.4 and then decrease the pulse width only slightly and that got rid of the diaphragmatic twitching that got rid of it so it is is worth trying that definitely it does it in the uk i've seen a lot of like centers actually try that when they're really struggling with um patients who have got pns that they've tried all the different vectors and um, you don't have that much of a safety margin you've just got a little bit um it's good to try that and, and play around with that. That is absolutely correct. And I've also set my patient actually at threshold because I didn't have any other options just to avoid uh, phrenic nerve steam. Yes. Yeah. But it can be very painful in the lab when you finally get into that vessel that you've struggled, you've done an inner, 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 and then you get there and it's all phrenic nerve steam. It, it can be very painful. But Again, if there's a if there's a if there's a reasonable um, difference between them, as Dr. Shaw said, I absolutely will take that vessel if that's the one that I think will give me the best anatomical position. Uh, if the phrenic nerve is capturing at four and my threshold is one, I don't move from that vessel. I take it and I keep it. On on that note too, um, it's kind of since we're talking about like the implanting as well. Um, when you're actually in the procedures, obviously most of this talk is about follow-up, but when you're in the procedure itself, you can take into account, you know, phrenic nerve stem where it's occurring and thresholds where you see the best thresholds and long-term lead stability as well. So it's all a larger conversation. So if you have a really big like drain pipe of a, of a vein that you're in and you only have viable capture at the tip electrode, that means if that lead pulls back, it is essentially useless at that point. And LV leads are most likely to pull back than any other lead. And if you have a big vein, it's even more likely, right? But if in fact you have like decent capture here, not great capture here, but viable capture over here or wherever it is, if the lead pulls back, you still have these electrodes um, into viable tissue as well. So um, back to kind of what Caleb had asked about, you know, bipolar versus quartet, leads, Quartet does give the advantage of if you have a lead stability issue, the lead may not pull all the way back into the atrium. It may just move back a couple, you know, millimeters or even a centimeter or so, and it still could be very viable. Um, so just take that into account that, you know, if you don't trust the lead stability and it only really works the tip, it's probably not going to be a viable location, or at least you should look at your other options. Any other questions from the group? Any other comments from the panelists? Hmm? Well, thank Man, you. Great job, Dr. Ogundil. We really appreciate you stepping in. This was great. No, 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 absolutely. It's a, it's a good topic, and it's something that's always evolving. And uh, sometimes we forget. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, so good for the wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. Dafe. Thank you, team. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of uh, your Sunday, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, AJ, for setting this up. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, AJ. Uh, thank you. Thank you, AJ.